what you would do. Ima again, imagine waking up every day of your life and you have no choice as to what you will do. You will cut stone, you will make bricks, you will carry water. And if you don't, you will be beaten. And if you do not submit, you will die. And so, for your wife and for your children, you slave on. For your husband and your parents, you slave on. For your, mother, for your children, for your mother and father, you slave on and on and on. Now some of the people, the really religious ones, they speak of the Lord, of hope, of the promise of the Savior. But in the midst of grinding slavery, generation after generation, on and on and on, it is hard. It is hard to hear the promises. It is hard to believe in this Savior. And then as if in a, in a moment, everything changes. Moses comes and he challenges Pharaoh and the Lord speaks through Moses to them, let my people go. But at first, Pharaoh would not, and he could not, because he could not imagine life without his Israelite slaves. And so for a little while, it got worse. He took out his anger on the people. But then there was the final plague, death, the Passover, and the firstborn of all the disbelievers died. And then, so then, yes, as if in a twinkling of an eye, then the Egyptians were saying, go, get out of here. Here, take our livestock, take our possessions. Go, Pharaoh says, no more death, out. And they began their journey out of Egypt, out of slavery. And yet, as they neared the Red Sea, Pharaoh had a change of heart. And he would again test the Lord and send his armies against Israel. And so as the people would have seen this cloud of soldiers coming to them, they would wonder, did we come all this way to die? And then the sea parted, and they walked through on dry ground. And the soldiers who came after them and mocked the Lord by doing so, the sea collapses on them, and Pharaoh's hatred and blasphemy is buried. For 430 years they had been in slavery. And the Lord had just delivered them in the most decisive way possible. And then they would look back on the turbulent waters behind them as the sea had closed over and they would see that sea filled with the debris of death as the Lord had taken out their slave masters and murderers. Ima imagine, imagine the jubilation right? Imagine it. After all that and all that journey and all those hundreds of years, now they were free. And so, so what did they do? They sang. In the sang, they sang the song that Moses wrote. And we sing it to this day. We just heard it. The enemy said, Moses wrote, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw the sword my hand shall destroy them, but you, Lord, you blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you redeemed. You have guided them by the strength of your strength to your holy abode. Now my suspicion is this morning that some of us, in a sense, are still in Egypt. That you're enslaved to something. You're trapped in selfishness. There's an addiction of some kind. There's something that you're doing and it, and it can seem like there's no way out. To be trapped in sin and in as we'll talk about this, for it to become basically this whatever it is, your God, that it can feel like there's no way out. And the stakes are high, let's be clear. Because struggling against some sin is one thing, but when it, when it becomes your all-consuming thing, it, it, is, it has become your God, 
Well, there's a danger there of falling away from God altogether. And indeed, it can seem like there's no way out. But there is. And Moses knows this way. For some 1,400 years after the first exodus, the Savior sent from the Father, Jesus, took his disciples, Peter and James and John, up on a mountainside to pray. We call it the transfiguration because there Jesus revealed his divine nature that he is not just a man and a prophet, but he is in fact God in the flesh. And as it were, in doing so, the, the veil of heaven is pulled back. And as Luke records for us in his account in chapter 9, Moses is there, and the prophet Elijah is there, and they are talking with Jesus. Moses talking with Jesus, as Luke tells us, about how Jesus exodus. That's the literal word in the Greek. Jesus exodus is about to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. You see, friends, the first exodus was a deliverance from physical slavery. But in the eternal plan of God, there was a design, a plan for a greater exodus, a greater deliverance, the deliverance from sin. And Moses knew this. This is why, as he wrote Deuteronomy, he promised, as the Lord would give it to him, that there would be a prophet that would come after him, to whom the people must listen. Thus the voice speaks at Jesus' baptism, and the voice speaks from the cloud at the transfiguration. Moses knows of the story of Abraham and Isaac, for he records it for us. That story that makes no sense unless that sacrifice predicts or foreshadows a greater sacrifice that will later come. And Moses certainly knows, as he records it for us, chapter 12, the great promise to Abraham, that a single descendant of Abraham, that through this one, this deliverer, all the people of the world would be blessed. Moses knew that the first exodus would be fulfilled by a greater exodus, the sign of signs. Jesus would be the complete and final sacrifice for sin. God himself would provide the lamb. And on the third day, he would rise from the dead, delivering us from our greatest enemies, sin and death and the devil. And that's no doubt part of the reason that Mary clung to the resurrected Christ. She had struggled so mightily, the scriptures tell us, possessed by seven demons. And in that moment, as she knows that Jesus is raised from the dead, she knows that he is the way out, the final deliverance. And in Christ, in his resurrected community of believers, the church, Mary found a family, support, and a way out of her former way of life. Christ's resurrection is, brothers and sisters, it is the sign of signs. It is the fulfillment of the exodus. That, it, that is, it is the new hope for all who struggle with sin and need forgiveness and a new beginning. And quite frankly, right, that's all of us. That's all of us. It's you today, it's me, it's all of us. We all need to be delivered out of Egypt. We need Christ, you need Christ and his forgiving word and in his church to find a community of believers to wander straight toward the path of heaven that is before us. Christ is the way out of sin and death and into light and life. There is forgiveness and freedom and hope in Christ. And therefore we, we say with St. Paul, our Paschal Lamb, our Passover sacrifice has set us free. That's Exodus language, deliverance language. And, and what do people who have been freed from sin, who, what do people do that have received this deliverance? We rejoice. We live. Now, of course, we know. We know, like our forefathers, because we know their history, we know that there will be some deserts ahead. 
we know that there will be some wandering in places in our lives where we will wonder what is going on. What is God doing here? We know that there will be losses and trials and tribulations. We know that loved ones will die. We know that we will struggle with temptation. We know that cancer may strike us. We know that the economy will ebb and flow. We know all these things, right? We, we know this, and yet we know above all that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. And that changes everything. That changes everything. And so what do we do? Having received this great deliverance, having been called out of Egypt and placed on the path toward our great heavenly home, what do we do? We sing. We forget what is behind. We don't worry about what may be ahead. We right now, we rejoice that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, just like our forefathers did when they were delivered from Pharaoh. We sing. Therefore, stand. Turn to page 465. We sing now all the vault of heaven resounds. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah.